Welcome everybody. It's lovely to have you all with us in our first of the uh, conservation series webinars of this year. We are delighted that you're joining us and there's so much interest about conserving and protecting the oceans. Um, so we have a group of really ex extraordinary women helping us uh, showcase the work that Bernard do, uh, does with the ocean, but we have a very special guest as well uh, with Julie Packard from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, um, joining us. Um, so uh, we're going to start uh, with Carolina. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with bird life, I, let me just tell you two sentences about what we are. Uh, we are an extraordinary family of 115 organizations uh, in uh, around the world. Every bird life partner is a national conservation organization on their own right. And we all come together as a family because we all love birds, but because we all use them as an extraordinary ambassador for nature. Uh, BirdLife has been around almost 100 years. We're gonna be celebrating our 100th anniversary next year. Um, and today we're going to be uh, talking about the extraordinary work that we do on the marine realm. Uh, we will continue this uh, conservation series. We had about seven uh, webinars last year, uh, and we will continue this year as well. And we are very excited that so many of you have uh, joined us. We will be recording the session, uh, so uh, if you have to drop off at any point, um, we will you will be able to see the uh, recording. And also, if you have people who are interested in this and have not been able to register, pass it on. Um, we will make it available to you guys in the next couple of days. All right, so let me make official introductions. Um, uh, we are going to start with Carolina. Carolina is uh, the... Um, uh, um, um, Burlap's Marine Policy Coordinator. She's been working with us for nine years. She's part of the policy team. Um, and she will start with her presentation uh, about what we are trying to do with the high seas. Carolina, let's start. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Hello, everyone. These days we say good morning, good evening, good afternoon. All these, all these time zones everywhere. Thanks for joining everyone. And I'll, I'll, I'll say also bon dia, uh, bonjour, buenos dias for everyone that is joining us. Um, as Patricia said, yeah, indeed, very exciting. There's no way that we cannot get excited about uh, talking um, about the high seas and the oceans. So um, let's, let's fly together in this uh, webinar. Okay, so I'll start off uh, talking about the high seas a bit, but mostly on the uh, governance side, who governs the high seas and the policies behind it, and um, the actions that bird life are, uh, are driving to protect biodiversity, birds and biodiversity in the high seas. So, before I start talking about oceans, I always like to show to show this this image because I think it's quite uh, it's quite telling. And I remember Sir David Attenborough that rightly called his uh, fantastic program the Blue Planet. We live in a blue planet; it's not planet Earth. Um, Seventy percent of the, the the globe is covered by ocean. So. Indeed, I think it justifies fascinating, but it also justifies our concern with the biodiversity that is in, in this uh, realm. It's absolutely fantastic. And also another thing that I always show when I talk about the ocean is that um, it, it's a calling. Every second breath you take comes from the ocean. So we may have this, um, uh, this image that uh, the oceans are unproductive, but they are pretty productive. They uh, capture CO2 and they produce oxygen that really makes our, our living as, as it is. So it's absolutely important, the health of the ocean so that we can uh, also take the best of, um, of our uh, life and well-being. And, but I'm talking about the high seas today, right? And the high seas, as you can see here, occupies 46% of the globe. So from the planet Earth or the blue planet, almost half of the area is covered by the high seas. And why I call it global common? Because this area, and I'll show uh, in the next slides exactly what it corresponds to, the, this area of the, the ocean, the high seas, is an area where no single country has jurisdiction. That is, no single country has the power to set rules and management uh, management uh, uh, actions alone. So it's a, an area where all countries together may decide what will be um, 
what will be the actions and the rules and the policies allowed in this space. So it's quite significant. And here I show that map to give us a, an idea what we are talking about. So the light blue area that you see in this map is what we call the high seas. And this area is uh, established from the coastal areas of the countries, 200 nautical miles from the coastal area of the baseline, I mean the, the, the tight baseline of the countries. You can count as the exclusive economic zone. And from that area, we have the high seas. So it, it's quite a significant area. Um, and as I said, is an area that no single country has jurisdiction. We know that the, uh, the coastal countries, and I, I'm in Brazil, so I, I can speak from here <laughs> as well. So we know that the coastal countries, they do have uh, the, the power to set uh, rules and policies to their coastal areas, as I said, until the 200 uh, my, nautical miles from their, their coasts. So having, having said that, you know that it's a massive area, it's extremely important, and if no country, no single country has jurisdiction over the high sea, so who governs that part of the ocean? And that, uh, that uh, figure here, this, uh, this organogram, shows all the organizations that have somehow a say in the ocean rules and policies. It's, it's a bit scary if we see the number of organizations that have some competence and mandate in this area of the globe. Um, and the, the one that is circled in red here, the UNCLOS, is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and we call it the Constitution of the Ocean. So it sets the basic principles on what what can happen and what cannot happen in the, 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 the principles and the practices that may be implemented in the high seas. However, uh, UNCLOS so far doesn't have uh, global provisions or global rules to uh, the conservation, to promote the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in the high seas. So each country can set their conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in their own EZ, that white area that I mentioned in the, the, the previous map, but not in the high seas. So it is, and I show the next, um, these next two slides I show here how the globe is divided. So we can see here that there are regional seas conventions that set some of these uh, practices and policies to, conserve, to promote the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, but they are regional. And we see some, just some of them have some mandate in the high seas, but they are mostly uh, have a, a exercising their competent oops, sorry, um, in, in areas of a exclusive economic zone. But we see it is very fragmented because each region has its own convention. The same thing for the regional fisheries management organizations. So they, they are split, they are fragmented, and each of these organizations have uh, the competence and set rules and provisions to different uh, places of the ocean, which means that the, the high seas are, it, it's kind of ruled by everyone in different sectors. It's fishing, there are organizations setting, uh, having competence, that has competence over fishing, some over mining, some over uh, transportation, traffic, shipping, etc. But um, as I said, there is a gap in, in governance on what regards to biodiversity conservation. And then we can think of the high seas is so far away, it's 200 nautical miles from the coast of the countries and it's massive. So is, is there anything going on there? Indeed, uh, everything happens in the high seas, it's quite populated. And I, I just have some slides here to, to show what, what happens in the high seas. So 40, oh, no 40, 4.2% of the global marine fisheries happens in the high seas. Uh, Steph, my, my colleague, will be presenting some of the issues related to fishing in the high seas after me. And 90% of data uh, are transported or, or through submarine cables across the globe. And it's quite a populated area indeed. The same thing for merchant shipping. 90% of the global uh, trade is done uh, through the seas and it, it, it is really an area that we cannot disregard as, as very important for a number of activities, economic activities and social activities. But of course that we know that all these activities which are quite important economically and, and socially, they also uh, 
exercise some pressure on biodiversity. So here, just to, to, to show some of them, overfishing is a problem. Uh, it is currently a, a problem because it, it's really impacting the fish stocks in the globe and therefore the whole food chain, some plastic pollution, uh, underwater noise uh, caused by, by shipping and uh, some unsustainable fishing practices calling it, uh, causing destructions of seabeds, uh, the, the seabeds. So yes, there are important activities happening in the high seas, but leaving some, some tracks behind which are being uh, damaging have been damaging biodiversity. And I, I like to show these amazing creatures here in, in, in the high seas. Uh, it's a fascinating world of creatures, as we say, amazing biodiversity in the high seas of, of all sorts, vertebrates, invertebrates. Uh, the fauna is, is really rich. And um, I wanted to show here, because we have this image when we talk about the ocean, we always think of the water column, but above the ocean, there's also biodiversity. And of course, that being from bird life, we look at this above water biodiversity, uh, which is the, the seabirds that they frequent the high seas. So the, this image here shows the tracking um, with tracking devices of uh, sheer waters that they leave the North, the, the North Atlantic and they fly all the way down to the Southeast Atlantic and they even cross to the, to the Indian Ocean here. And the, this is just one species that does, that does this travel. It's a, and, and you see that they cross borders of the countries, they go to the high seas um, and they spend quite some time in the high seas just demonstrating how important this area of the globe, which is currently known governed in terms of conservation is for, for seabirds. And the next slide is uh, a result of a, a recent paper that has been published with participation of, of, of bird life on the use of the high seas by uh, albatrosses and petrel. And uh, what we see here, and you see this uh, purple uh, bars, the time that the birds, and this is just one species on demonstration of one species, spending in the high seas, as opposed to the time that the individuals spend in other countries. So you can see here that uh, yellow is Portugal, for instance, red is Spain, and there's Brazil, Morocco, Namibia, South Africa, and other countries. So it's one single species that uses the, the, the jurisdictions of, of, of many countries and they cross into the high seas where they spend most of the time. And with that, what I want to say is that we really have uh, interest and concern in providing the, the, that conservation measures and policies are in place to, to allow for for these species to, to thrive. Oops, I've lost my mouse here. Let me see how I can. So uh, given, given uh, what I, I briefly, very briefly showed, it's really a very a quick brush through, through uh, governance and threats of the high seas. We, we've seen the, the various uses of the high seas, some of the threats very briefly again, and how important the area is for seabirds and other biodiversity. So bird life, um, as Patricia presented, uh, a, a global conservation organization. We are looking at birds, but as, as flagship for the whole environment, we are looking at uh, our conservation goals, but we are looking at establishing or identify important areas for seabirds at sea. Um, but we also want to address bycatching fisheries so that this bycatch, which Steph will cover soon, is reduced or eliminated. We also are concerned uh, with the overfishing because of course uh, this is um, a, a considerable impact to seabirds because of competition for food. Marine pollution is reduced. We are also looking at the various sources of pollution which are impacting various um, populations of seabirds and other biodiversity. And certainly the ocean climate policies are integrated. So these are our main conservation goals. Um, I, I won't go into the details of uh, each of them, but just really to give us a, a quick glimpse of what we are working on. So as I, as I showed that graph before, there are so many organizations looking at the high seas, but at the same time, there is no single global um, organization or framework or policy framework that looks at the uh, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. So recognizing this gap, 
the United Nations have started a negotiation of a, it's a very long name, internationally legally binding instrument for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond areas, uh, biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's a mouthful. We call it, um, we call it the bb &J Treaty or the High Seas Treaty is the nickname of that massive agreement, but uh, the countries have been negotiating that uh, or, or talking about the need for this agreement for, for a decade, over a decade now. And we are in the final, I mean, we as, as, in a, commu as a community, this treaty is being negotiated by governments, but we as community are, are working on that. Um, now I was going to say that, yeah, working for, for the last 10 years at least, but it's in the final stages of negotiation. So because of the pandemic, the, the last uh, meeting to agree on the text of this uh, agreement was going to be last year. And it's now foreseen to happen this year. We don't know what's going what's going to happen, but this is will be a, a, a land a landmark or maybe a sea mark, if I can say that way, uh, for for conservation in in the oceans. And within this treaty, BirdLife voices for the establishment and effective management of a network of marine protected areas on those areas that are key and important for seabirds and other biodiversity. We want this uh, instrument, of course, to have provisions to allow for consistent and accountable and rigorous environment impact assessment. And we also are looking at or we are advocating for this treaty uh, negotiated, being negotiated by the United Nations to set uh, provisions for a coherence and coordination among the various governing bodies in the high seas. As, as I showed in that previous graph, there are so many organizations that don't talk to each other and we, we want this uh, new instrument to provide the basis for uh, coordination among these, these various bodies so that we have uh, consistency in, in practices across the board. So just a quick few actions uh, here that we are uh, involved. So I, I've set the scenes of what is going on there uh, in terms of negotiations, the pressures, the, the, the importance of the high seas to species and uh, our conservation goals and specifically to the high seas treaty, what we are doing at the moment. So we are pressing government for the best outcomes at the United Nations Intergovernmental Conference for the BBNJ Treaty, as I nicknamed it, and I mean, not me, but we, as we call it. Um, so we are, we are following the negotiations and, and trying that, uh, pushing for the best outcomes. And we work with through alliances, not only through our partnership, but we work, for instance, with the uh, High Seas Alliance, a, a membership of organizations, and also through a, a project with other partner organizations, the Strong High Seas Project. And we participate in these meetings. Uh, we have strategic meetings with governments, uh, uh, demonstrating the importance, showing the evidence that we, we, uh, we produce in bird life, the scientific evidence to, uh, to guide and inform the countries in the decisions that they will make uh, for the treaty. Um, so as I said, we are informing high seas area policies with science and um, we host the, the largest database on, on areas important for seabirds, the marine ones. And here I just show some of these areas, the key ones for seabirds um, that we also demonstrate to countries the value for for biodiversity uh, through the through the database that we have, sorry. Um, and this one I wanted to highlight. So you can see here in the Northeast Atlantic, the Evlanov Seamount Basin. So bird life is working very closely with the, the OSPA, it's an OSPA convention country. It's a, a convention, a regional seas convention in the Northeast Atlantic with the European countries. So bird life is, is supporting and advocating for the protection of this area, for the, uh, this area to be established as a marine protected area. You'll be, it's in the final stages of negotiation. Just to have an idea, it's the size of France, this area, and it's, it's uh, used by over 5 million birds per year. It's an extremely significant area and important area. And uh, our science team is working um, for the last years to get all the, the information and uh, the scientific evidence to work with governments to, to recognize this area as an important one for protection and having management uh, measures in place. Now, this is just one example of uh, actions that we have in the high seas. And 
Uh, finally, I, I just have a two other slides to finalize. Uh, producing knowledge, so we, we have our science team uh, supporting, supporting the knowledge production to strengthen ocean governance, and we also develop capacity of uh, governments on the negotiations so that they can have um, an informed voice during these complex negotiations of this new treaty. And we also work alongside with our communications team back in our advocacy with strong communications. So um, here it was a high, it was a high level event where Patricia, I can see here, Patricia uh, participated with influential, with influential uh, decision makers to discuss, um, to discuss the protection of the high seas and the need for this new agreement under the United Nations to be adopted. Um, and that was uh, an event that Prospect Magazine has supported and also the High Seas Alliance uh, that uh, has led us through that. And also uh, we, we do our advocacy, for instance, the, the result of that meeting was uh, um, an article that was sent to the European members of parliament, again, with a view to inform their decisions uh, towards the adoption of this new agreement. And I could not uh, end my presentation without saying that the work is not done just by me, it's done by a whole team. And I apologize for all the others of the team that are not here because we are, we are a, a group of fantastic people, but I, I, I really just put here the science team and the policy team at the Boyd Life Secretariat, but Steph, which is uh, speaking just after me, she's also part of the team, but she, yeah, she sits uh, with another group and I, I couldn't populate the whole slide, but thank you for everyone. And it's, it's a group effort, really. So we will continue our efforts talking about it to make impact to difference. And, um, and that's it. And I hope you have enjoyed this blue journey into the high seas. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. I think you've made it incredibly clear how complicated it is to try to protect the high seas. Um, so from that very high level overview uh, of the policy complications of managing the, our resources in the oceans. Let's go into how are we tackling something very specific with Steph. Uh, Stephanie Prince is the uh, bycatch program manager of uh, the marine program of BirdLife that is uh, hosted by the RSPB. Marine program is one of the best examples of how BirdLife works. So we have all of our staff scattered between the BirdLife secretariat and the, the partners and Steph is um, part of the RSPB team but works as part of the BirdLife uh, Marine Program. Um, before I pass it on to her, just um, a reminder that if you have questions, uh, uh, type them on the Q&A box. The chat should be disabled right now, but if you can type your questions, and many of you have done so already, um, on the Q&A, uh, we will be able to get to you and, um, with that, let me pass on to Steph. Thanks, Patricia, and welcome to everybody today. As Patricia said, I'm going to be talking about a more specific example of some of the work that BirdLife and the RSPB and other BirdLife partners are doing, and that's on the issue of seabird bycatch um, on the high seas, but also um, closer to countries through our Albatross Task Force work. So why is bycatch so important? Well, a really piece, uh, important piece of work that was conducted by Maria Diaz from BirdLife looked at the threats to seabirds and bycatch came out as impacting 100 different seabird species. And for some, some groups, such as the albatrosses, it's actually a really high threat. So 95% of all albatross species are threatened by bycatch. And for other groups, um, like the penguins, it's 65%. So it is a threat that is very far reaching across many bird species. And it is one of the main reasons why we've been trying to tackle this for quite a few years now. And what does it actually look like on the ground? Well, these two photos um, show the really stark contrast between what was happening back in the late 70s and just a couple of years ago. So this is the same colony on South Georgia and it was taken at the same time of year. So really you'd expect to see very similar numbers of birds, but you can see the very obvious decline in, in this gray-headed albatross colony. And a, a survey of the whole island showed a 43% decline in just 11 years, showing like, the massive impact that bycatch is having in particular regions. So what is bycatch? 
Well, bycatch occurs because seabirds are very attracted to fishing vessels. Many of them have a really great sense of smell, so they can be attracted from miles away to these fishing vessels. And you can see in this photo here, which was taken in the Falkland Islands, um, just how many birds can be attracted to one vessel. And in the case of trawlers, what happens is that the steel cables that are towing the, the net through the water, they're very dangerous. And so birds can either fly into them as they're going through the air and have their wings broken, or as in the case in this picture, you might just be able to make out in the bottom right hand corner, a bird actually being dragged under the water by that cable. And in long liners, um, which or what most tuna fisheries are, um, birds will try and grab the fish or the squid that is being used as bait. But unfortunately, in many, many instances, the bird will become hooked and pulled under and drowned. So it's quite a sad story, really. And it's estimated that between 160,000 and 320,000 seabirds are killed in longline fisheries in this way every single year. And for trawl fisheries, the number is somewhere in the tens of thousands. So it's a big, big, big problem. But it's not all such a sad story because we do actually have solutions to the bycatch issue and which we can't say about a lot of the other threats facing seabirds. So what are those solutions? Well, there are three main solutions that can be used in tandem for longline fisheries. So just to put it simply, that is to set your fishing lines at night when not many seabirds are very active to use what we call bird scaring lines, which you can see on the top right here, which are colorful streamers that act as a, almost a physical barrier. So you can see there are no birds in the middle there, keeps away, them away from the dangerous areas. And the third um, is using weights close to the hook so that as the hooks are going into the water, they're sinking really quickly, giving a lot less opportunity for birds to come into contact with them. So using all three of those in tandem means that you're very unlikely to be catching birds. There's also a fourth option, um, which you can see here called the hook pod. And so this is a device that can be used as a standalone option. And it's a device that encases the barb of the hook, which means as it goes into the water, birds can't actually access the hook. And so they can, nothing will happen to them. And then as it sinks down and reaches fishing depth, then it automatically opens and and fish as normal. So that's a really great device as well. So those are the options. So the BirdLife International Marine Program has been working on bycatch issues since around 2004. We work in two different areas. So we work within the EEZ. So that's the areas within 200 nautical miles of countries' coastlines. And we currently work in five countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Namibia, and South Africa. These particular countries were chosen because they have many albatrosses coming to their waters and therefore the birds were at quite high risk when we started this work. The second location we work on is in the high seas through the regional fisheries management organization that Carolina was, gonna, was talking about earlier. From now I'm going to refer to them as the RFMOs. I don't like to use too many acronyms in these talks but it's quite a, a long one to say so I'll be using that from now on. So how does the albatross task force work? So the model for the Albatross Task Force is really a very much a grassroots engagement process. And so within each of those countries that I mentioned, we work with either the bird life partners or with other local organizations. Um, and those local partners will engage with fishers in port and they'll also go out onto vessels. So it's very, it's very much a case of spending a lot of time gaining the trust of fishers and working with them to provide solutions. So in all of those countries, we've tested what we call the mitigation measures um, to see how they work in those fisheries. And once we've proven through science that they do work, then we work with governments to ensure that those, those measures become regulation. And then the final thing we do, which is probably the most important thing, is to keep working in those fisheries to ensure that those those um, measures will be used and it will become a sustainable solution that we can then step back from and see bird bycatch reductions permanently. And we've had some great successes. So I can't list everything in this limited time, um, but some of our biggest successes have come in Namibia, where we've seen a 98% reduction in seabirds killed in the long line fishery. We've just published a paper this year to demonstrate that, that massive reduction. One of our first successes came in South Africa, where we had a reduction of 99% of albatrosses being killed in the trawl fishery there. 
And in all the target fisheries that we've worked in, we've achieved regulations in every single one. Um, so when you look at all those successes, that actually equates to around 30,000 birds every year not being killed because of the actions that we've taken alongside local partners. And of the fisheries that we work in, so our initial aim was to reduce bycatch by 80% and we're on target to achieve that in at least eight out of the 10 fisheries that we're working in. But you can't just work in those countries if you want to tackle seabird bycatch. As Carolina was saying, birds are spending a lot of time outside of those areas on the high seas. And this, um, this diagram just shows nicely the distribution of, of some of these species. So you can see here for three albatross, oh, three albatross species, you can see where they're distributed. And you can see that they're, they're very, they're quite different, but they're very spread out across oceans. So we need to be protecting them globally. So on the high seas, we estimate that around 36,000 albatrosses are being killed every year. I think this is quite a conservative number, um, but it's still very high. Um, and back in 2004, BirdLife did some work to estimate just how much time albatrosses were spending on the high seas and within the, the tuna RFMOs. So on this diagram, don't worry about any of the, the names. The key thing to notice is these blue, looks like um, ink blotches, and so that shows where albatrosses are spending their time. And you can just see how much of it is spread around the Southern Oceans and in the North Pacific as well. Um, and that recent paper, Maria, Maria, sorry, Carolina mentioned was um, that 40% of the bird's time was spent on the high seas. So what was the situation when we started this work? Well, back in 2004, when we started work in the RFMOs, there was very little happening to protect seabirds. You can see on this chart here, the only um, RFMO that was doing much was this one called Kamla, which covers the Antarctic waters. And they'd been working heavily on this problem. They'd essentially solved this problem way back in 2004, whereas all the other tuna fisheries had barely started even recognizing this as a problem. And it's important that they do, because you can see at the bottom there that actually the Antarctic area only accounted for 16% of the albatross distribution and the rest was in these other areas. So it's vital that we made some improvements to that. So what's the situation now? Well, in 2020, you can see we've made some progress. We've made those blue lines a bit longer. Um, but the key thing to note is that none of them are actually at the same level yet as the um, Antarctic one was way back in 2004. So we have measures in place in them all, but we're not quite there yet. So what are the successes we've had? Well, I think the key success is that all tuna longline fish it, fishing vessels that are operating in areas that overlap with albatrosses are now required to use some form of mitigation measures. So that's really good. And there's also a requirement for data to be collected on seabirds in all five of the tuna RFMOs up from just one when we started this work. And similarly, um, we, they all now have a seabird risk assessment in place, which none of them had it back in 2004. And how have we done this? Well, through a lot of work and advocacy. So we spent years doing advocacy and policy work within the RFMOs. We've conducted science. We've presented papers on bycatch um, at these meetings. We've worked really hard to develop relationships with key governments and fishing industries across the world. We've done port-based outreach with Asian distant water fishing vessels, because unlike the ATF where you can go to the port and meet the fishers, a lot of these fishers are coming from all over the world and they're spending months, if not years at sea. So there's no opportunity to, to meet with them. Um, but this work we've done has really allowed us to actually get on the vessels and talk to the fishers. And we've also done lots of collaborative work with other NGOs and research institutes. But the problem's not been solved yet. So the problems remaining are widespread non-compliance with the seabird mitigation measures, and in some cases, under-reporting of bycatch levels, which is really compounded by the fact that observer coverage on the high seas is very low. There's not many people out there looking at what's actually going on. And the RFMOs themselves don't have very strong enforcement systems. So even if you don't use the, the mitigation measures, nothing essentially will happen to you. And a few examples just to highlight this. So um, last, well, in 2019 in the South Pacific, one country reported that they were only using measures 36% of the time. 
And that same country then reported that they were killing what would be equivalent to around six and a half thousand birds a year in the South Pacific and almost 17,000 in the North Pacific if you look at their observed bycatch rates. So that's obviously a massive problem still. And there's also large discrepancies in reported bycatch rates between fleets of similar sizes. So some very similar size fleets to, to that country are reporting essentially no bycatch, um, which doesn't really, doesn't really add up when you look at where they're fishing. So how many vessels are actually monitored? Well, this is, shows 100 vessels and of 100 vessels, typically just 5% of fishing is monitored at the moment. Um, in one RFMO, it's 10%, but typically five. So for 95% of the time, basically have no idea what's happening on those boats. And if you think back to the example of 36% compliance with observation, it seems very likely that boats without observation are probably not using the mitigation measures. So how can we improve this? So there's a number of things we can do to try and improve compliance. And I'm just going to very briefly go through some of the things that we're working on at the moment. So the biggest one for us is really the uptake of electronic monitoring. So you might wonder what is electronic monitoring? So electronic monitoring is another way of observing what's happening on the boat without needing human observers aboard. So this can be on vessel monitoring. So you can use cameras to determine when birds are hauled aboard. Um, and you can also use them like in this example here to monitor the use of a bird scaring line. And you can use lower tech stuff such as sensors on winches to detect what time you're setting um, and if bird scaring lines are being used again. There's also the option to do off vessel monitoring. So you can use satellite data. So vessels are pinging out signals um, which can be picked up by satellites. And we work with Global Fishing Watch to develop an algorithm to determine what time they're actually setting the, um, the lines in the water. Um, and then once you've actually got all this data, then you need to analyze that data. So there's some projects going on at the moment to develop artificial intelligence to automatically identify birds that are being caught and hold on to boats. And there's a project in New Zealand, which is aiming to really reduce the amount of data that's needed for this, because that's a limiting factor um, in, in the uptake of, of electronic monitoring. So that would be a thing that would be a real game changer having that. Um, and when electronic monitoring is used, it becomes much easier to scale up the number of um, observer coverage. So we want to see 100% because that wouldn't only solve this problem for seabirds, but it also would help with other issues at sea, such as human rights abuses and other, other issues like shark finning and many other issues that are associated with these types of fisheries. There also needs to be consequences for non-compliance. So RFMOs really need to strengthen what they're doing in that respect. We need to see better trained observers because if you don't have a well-trained observer, then you're never gonna understand the problem. And there also needs to be some pressure coming from the supply chain and consumers to say that we really want to see all of these vessels doing something to stop this from happening. So these are all areas that we're working on and these are gonna be going into our next 10 years worth of, of work in our new strategy. And I'm going to leave it there because I don't have much time. But if you have questions, then please add them to the Q&A box. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was awesome. Um, a lot of questions already coming for you. But uh, before I open it up for the question and answer, I do want to um, have a little bit of a conversation with a very special guest that we have today. Uh, Julie Packard has been very kind to join us. Uh, for those of you who don't know Julie, Julie is the executive director of the Monterey Aquarium, uh, which she founded in the late 1970s. Um, she's a marine biologist uh, and she earned her master's degree in biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, with a focus on marine algae. Um, she's an international leader, uh, has received awards and medals, um, and more, or more above everything, she's a super cool person. Um, and we are ex very excited that you have been able to join us, Julie. Um, we're not gonna do a presentation, but rather we're gonna do a conversation, which I think you guys will appreciate, especially those of you who are in, um, in on Zoom every single day at many hours of the day. Um, so Julie, thank you again for joining us. It's lovely to have you. Um, 
let's start with the incredible role that the Monterey Aquarium has played connecting people to the health of the ocean. Um, it's clear that education and awareness are necessary to get the ocean to be more of a priority to all of us. What are, in your experience, the ways uh, to increase that, that awareness of the state of the ocean and what people can really do to help protect and restore the health of our blue environment? Well, thanks, Patricia. It's great to be with you in the audience and great presentations, Carolina and Stephanie. Really, really appreciated that. Just want to thank you all for the fantastic work. Um, really inspiring. So, um, yes, this is the crux of the problem, right? You know, how do we get people engaged with these places that are so distant from, you know, from, from where they are and where we live? And of course, the Monterey Bay Aquarium We've learned a lot about that uh, over over the years. Again, it's mostly with the U.S. audience that visits us, but we have a good percentage of folks from around the world. And you know, not surprisingly, um, I mean, I'm a scientist by training, and I mean, I started out thinking, oh, people just knew the facts. You know, they would realize how terrible it is, and we need to fix these things. And of course, as as we all know, you know, we really do, really need to start by um, appealing to people's values and, and um, you know, striking that emotional connection, which is what we really work to do at the aquarium. And I think we'd all, um, we'd all agree our own personal relationships to the ocean. If we have one, you know, they generally are either, either we grew up near the coast or we love wildlife or we, um, the ocean makes us calm and serene. And so there's some really interesting studies actually that, um, uh, Packard Foundation has funded um, around this idea that people are hardwired to love the ocean, but that we all come from a different frame, um, a, a, as I mentioned, of, of why, uh, why it speaks to us and why we care about it. So um, we're still learning, but it's just a, a huge imperative that we continue to open people's eyes and um, seeing the amazing animals, hearing the remarkable stories, and just, you know, there's amazing, along with places like the aquarium, there are amazing films out these days that are just, you know, remarkable stories of, of people and, and the animals too, so. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. No, thank you for that. And, and I remember growing up in Ecuador and watching um, uh, Jacques Cousteau and his amazing um, documentaries of the ocean. And even when I lived in the, uh, in the mountains, um, yet really feeling that connection. But I think there are there's a um, there's a very important role that consumers play. Um, and you guys have been working uh, with the seafood, you created Seafood Watch. That was something that I absolutely love and I use all the time when I'm buying my seafood. Um, and and especially when we're talking about the high seas. Uh, you know, it feels so far away and, and Carolina just showed it so well that it's so, it's such a mess in terms of the, govern, in the governance. Um, but that relationship between consumers, I mean, we are eating fish that is coming from the high seas, but we don't know about it. And I think you guys have done an extraordinary thing uh, with Seafood Watch. Can you tell us more about how the aquarium came up with the idea and the impact that it has had over the last years? And how do you see consumer choices hopefully changing and improving the health of the oceans? Absolutely. Well, I love to talk about Seafood Watch because it's been such a cool success story and we all need that in conservation. So, um, so Seafood Watch, which began as, as a consumer guide to sustainable seafood, uh, was an outgrowth of an exhibit we did about the global fisheries crisis at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, this was 20 years ago now. And, and from that, we decided, well, uh, actually, to be honest, we have a restaurant at the aquarium. And we thought, well, if we're talking about the fisheries crisis, we better you know, figure out, is, is the seafood we're serving sustainable? And with that, um, this grew into a global program and really a whole network of, of NGOs working from a lot of angles on um, using consumer power to drive market demand for more sustainable seafood. So Seafood Watch established a set of sustainability criteria, um, again, around environmental sustainability. Of course, we've got social sustainability and economic sustainability. There's, there's many definitions, but so we um, look at the criteria and, and rank 
um, all the seafood species that are in the U.S. market, and the U.S. is, I think right now, the second biggest import market for, it's the second biggest market for seafood in the global seafood supply. So all that fishing going on in the high seas that we talked about today, we, uh, we're consuming, we're buying a lot of that. And, um, and uh, especially um, when you look at the fact that our biggest, the top three things that Americans like to eat, uh, salmon, most of which is farmed now, that's another story, um, tuna and shrimp. So we have, we have a big, uh, a big influence on the whole global tuna fishing scene. And by, by ranking and rating um, the, the different tuna fisheries and their regions and the different species, we are, um, first of all, you know, calling out their sustainability, but also um, consumers are asking questions. And, and uh, over, over these 20 years, working with celebrity chefs and also um, consumers, we, we've moved up to working with retailers now. 85% of the big retailers in America have time-bound commitments to bring all their seafood in a sustainable state, which is amazing. And, um, and then from that, then you got to ask, well, where's all the sustainable seafood going to come from? So now we're working with the buyers um, at the high level. Uh, and when, when big companies like Costco and Walmart are demanding sustainable seafood, it really makes a difference. And so that's, it, it's, it's all the way through the supply chain now. It's very exciting. We have a long way to go though. I mean, we're in a race because the scale of, of fishing going on, especially in the high seas is, you know, and, 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 and as you said, you very well demonstrated the problems, you know, we need better management, but we also need enforcement. We need the science. We need good data about what's going on. And, um, and, and we have the solutions. We, we can get there. But consumers have a huge influence. And it's been super exciting to see, um, see how we've all made that link um, to, you know, to influence the global, the global fishing you know, trajectory, if you will. I'm sorry, my mute button got completely stuck. That's actually a fantastic segue to the next question that I have for you, because there's a role that the, the consumers play and, and you have showed the connection between Seafood Watch and the regular buyer and the pressure that they make into the, the retailers that are actually selling. But you guys have worked a lot on the supply chain and making it transparent. And I was listening to bits and pieces of the World Ocean Summit that the Economist put out uh, a couple of weeks ago, or was it last week? Um, and there's a lot of there was a lot of emphasis on transparency on the supply chains and making sure that we really understand how where the where the fish and the seafood are coming from and how can we make sure that it's truly sustainable. Um, and, and the aquarium has been working for a long time with the shrimp industry. Uh, can you tell us a little more about your experience and what has worked well and what hasn't? And especially, what do you see that has worked that can be transferred to the other fisheries? I mean, we'll put salmon aside a little bit, but let's talk about how what has worked with shrimp. Yes, yes. Well, shrimp is a great story. And again, it's in the top um, seafood items in the U.S., we're a huge market for it, and um, and ninety percent of it's imported. And the shrimp, uh, the shrimp aquaculture, you know, it's it's mainly fun. that's all farm shrimp. And uh, we've we've because we're using U.S. market leverage to to try to influence these fisheries. We've done a lot of work on shrimp. So the really exciting piece that has happened is that um, you know we've 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 defined and rated the, you know, what what sustainable shrimp aquaculture looks like, and then, but we've taken it all and and we've created the demand for more sustainable shrimp in the market, and so uh, where we're working now is with the big shrimp farming companies and also their small farmers on the ground, and um, Vietnam is an especial. Uh, uh, success story area for us right now where we um, work to get a commitment with Minfu Seafoods, which is one of the, the biggest um, shrimp companies in, in Vietnam. 
and uh, to make a commitment, this was a couple of years ago, to bring 20,000 shrimp farms up to a Seafood Watch green rating um, by 2025. Right now, all farm shrimp is red, meaning, meaning it's, a, it's a don't buy, it's an avoid. And this is because shrimp farms, they've got myriad problems. You know, they've you know, caused mangrove conversion. There's a lot of um, drug use that leaks into the natural environment. There's waste, pollution, there's myriad issues. So, um, and, and, and how we've done this is also developed really easy tools for these small shrimp farmers, I mean, they can't pay to get um, certified by, by one of the big seafood certification entities. Um, you know, people might know about the Marine Stewardship Council. You know, you have to have third parties. It's like a big ordeal, costs a lot of money. We're working to make the, the, the monitoring and assessment really simple using, you know, a, a tablet based, you know, can, can assess in an hour, you know, what is, you know, how are things going on your farm and, and report back. And it's a whole consortium of farmers that are doing this. And then um, more recently, we got an even bigger commitment, um, a regional commitment that's uh, in one of the provinces there that's like 100,000 farms and the government is involved and in helping to, you know, ensure that this moves forward. Because ultimately, you know, you need government policy, as you described, and you need local commitment for enforcement. And, and because we're giving access to these shrimp farmers to a market that wants sustainable product, um, we also do, do the matchmaking um, to, to get their product sold. So that works, that works super exciting. It's one of the, the big success stories. And we're working, I mean, there's the shrimp farming is a huge source of economic livelihood, you know, across the world. We're starting to work in India a bit. Um, we're working in Indonesia um, on, on uh, actually that's blue swimming crab, but all of these products that can be, you know, farmed sustainably, it, it's, not, it's not that difficult to do when it comes to shrimp farming. So, um, so that's, that, that's, that's a great success story to give us, give us hope and, and optimism. Well, and, and, and extraordinary um, measures that can be replicated in some of the other fisheries as well. Um, thank you so much, Julie. This is, this is exciting to hear. It's exciting to learn more. Um, so let me jump and open it up for some of the questions that we're seeing from the audience. Um, I wanted to start with certification and I wanted to start with you, Julie, uh, if that's all right. Um, so we've seen a lot of certification and labels coming up from the MSC to others. Um, how effective do you think they are? Tony's asking whether there's uh, effective certification for the high seas. Tell us a little bit more about your experience and your point of view about certification in general. Yeah, I mean, that's such a good question. And um, uh, our, the Packard Foundation has, has funded, uh, we are an early supporter of the Marine Stewardship Council, which was sort of the big first um, seafood certification program, which is still going on. And, um, you know, they're, they're certainly not perfect, you know, they're problematic, but they have, you know, they've set standards and, and have, um, have caused improvement in these fisheries. That, that's the upside. And, and you've seen, you know, they do provide an incentive for these fisheries to improve. And the thing that has gotten um, difficult about them is, uh, it, you know, as I mentioned, it's very expensive. They were first designed to kind of address big fisheries, you know, like Alaskan wild caught salmon. That was a, an early certified um, seafood item or, um, you know, Alaskan Pollock, for example. Of course, the more we learn, you know, the ocean's changing so rapidly, and the more we learn about the status of these things, oftentimes it's like, oh, we thought it was maybe okay, but in the case of Pollock, we're learning, oh, there's ecosystem impacts, you know, there's a lot of other animals that are competing for that seafood item, and what's the impact of that? So they're not perfect, um, and actually, the, the difference 
I think the certifications and Seafood Watch work well in parallel because Seafood Watch is like a watchdog program. We we measure your sustainability whether you want us to or not. It's just there for the public to know and for the companies to know. Then you can decide, you know, do you want to work with an NGO on a fisheries improvement project, which means you have a plan to get better, you know, and, and ultimately get to where you can become certified. The big problem with the certification right now really is that it's just gotten it's gotten very complicated. You know, well caught salmon was certified, but then when you really parse it out, the different runs, the different the different populations of salmon, yeah, some of them should not be certified and some of them should be certified. And it's it's expensive to do and it's becoming more and more complicated, but it's a useful tool. That's what I'd say. Yeah, and I think what you what you said in terms of combining the tools, both the certification and 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 seafood watch is incredibly important. Um, thank you, Julie. Uh, so let's let's move on to Carolina. Um, is the U.S. a supporter of the BBNJ efforts? Asks Brad. And can can we also dovetail very quickly on whether nuclear testing is happening in the high seas? Okay, um, thanks for the questions. Yes, the US is participating in the negotiations. Uh, most of the countries in the world are uh, participating in the negotiations of the uh, new treaty. Uh, although the US and some other countries are not part of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the, the framework that is being negotiated under. But yes, it, it is. And in terms of, uh, it, 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 it actually it's a very active uh, country and even not being a party of UNCLOS, of course, that all countries will have uh, some somehow um, a, a spillover effect of, of any treaty that uh, regulates conservation and sustainable use in the high seas. Um, in terms of the treaty, I'm aware that the, a treaty in 63 banned uh, nuclear weapons in the atmosphere uh, testing in atmosphere and underwater as well. It's not an area that I follow closely, but yeah, it shouldn't be, uh, it's not allowed. It shouldn't be done. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't know. Um, all right, let's move into uh, Stephanie. Um, uh, there's a very good question from the Galapagos Islands and I have to give priority to my country, sorry. <laughs> No bias. <laughs> uh, Steph, can you just quickly repeat the three actions um, that, that we have been implementing to reduce bycatch? Uh, because um, uh, I think it's Maria asking for whether we can actually implement this in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, okay. so sure, thanks for the question. So it, just, it does depend on what kind of fishery we're talking about. But if it's for a long line fishery, then the three options were to set your lines at nighttime when birds are less active to use bird scaring lines, which are the streamers that come down and protect the area, creating a physical barrier. And then the third one was putting weights near to the hook so that they sink a lot quicker. So you can, if you use all three of those in combination, that's best practice, but in most places, two of the three um, is kind of what the rules are. And if you're talking about trawling fisheries, then just the bird scaring lines, that's, that's all you need to do. Um, but it depends on, on the type of fishery. Great. Um, another one for you uh, very quickly. Uh, so we, you talked a little bit about electronic monitoring, but um, Nirmal was asking also about innovation and artificial intelligence. Are we, are we starting to work on that and, and how is that going? Yeah, so the BirdLife program itself isn't really getting involved in creating that technology because there are many people out there better placed to be actually doing that technological innovation. I think one of the, the kind of highlights of, of things that we've worked on in the last couple of years is our work with Global Fishing Watch who um, monitor all the fishing activity around the world. So working with them to try and monitor night setting rates using independent data was a really exciting, um, exciting thing for us to do. And that was the first time ever that we were able to go to one of the RFMO meetings and say, we can see what's happening across your entire fleet, which has never, never been done before. So that, that was really good. And we're hoping that's going to build over the next few years and, and to the point where countries themselves are using this kind of data to monitor what's happening. 
Um, the electronic monitoring has been around for quite a long time. So some countries and some fisheries have been using it for like the last 20 years almost, but it's been typically a very expensive thing to use. So it's only for fisheries that are extremely high value. So for smaller fisheries, it's just not been possible for them to afford to use that. But as technology is coming on, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. And with the artificial intelligence to monitor things without having to have someone sit and go through hours and hours, days and days of data, it's becoming much more of a realistic prospect for use. And I know the Nature Conservancy are hoping to get electronic monitoring onto somewhere between 300 and 600 vessels this year. So it's something that's happening right now and it's, it's quite exciting. Great. Um, so let's go back for a second to Carolina. Um, there's a really cool comment from Chris Barrio about the database that you have behind you. Uh, so I think it'd be really used. Uh, it'd be really useful if you can speak a little bit about the database. But more importantly, um, also how is that helping us guide the conservation of areas with uh, marine IBAs? Um, and if you can describe the success or application so far of all of our data in that conservation, in the conservation of these areas. Um, sorry, I was unmuting myself. Yes. Uh, yeah, I like that background. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful background and it, 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 uh, it shows the dots where birds were tracked. So we do work with over 200 scientists across the globe. So we need to think and acknowledge the contributions of uh, scientists ev um, everywhere. Um, they, they provide the, they, they share the data with bird life and we manage this data, we, we host this data in the seabird tracking database that we, we have. Um, and over five, 15 million uh, points that we have of information and we have information of almost 200 uh, species uh, currently. And uh, of course, that this, this information is, is being used uh, for various of the work that BirdLife does, including uh, we can, uh, with tracking data, we know where the birds are, uh, when, and how, how long. So we, we have important information to identify the areas that are key for, for their um, uh, for their living and for their survival, the time that they spend uh, feeding, where they reproduce, where uh, where they yeah feed, I, I've already said. So with that information, our science team can identify the areas that are important for 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 seabirds, which are, we call the marine important bird and biodiversity areas. And in my presentation, I have shown. Uh, Patricia, one example of how we are, a very concrete example of how we are using this data. So with this uh, tracking data that we have uh, hosted in, in the database, we could identify this very, very important area in the Northeast Atlantic, in the OSPA convention area, that now BirdLife has provided the information for countries to um, enter the process to, to recognize that area as a protected area. So that's a very concrete example where marine aviation is informing conservation and we are hoping to have this area uh, protected very soon. And, and that's a perfect example of birds guiding uh, our work with conservation areas. But I wanted to ask Julie, um, how do you see uh, the engagement um, or how can we use the power of birds to engage um, more people uh, for the conservation of the high seas and, and the ocean in general? Do you see a connection? How, how can we take advantage of the magnificency of these amazing birds? And I was loving every single picture that you guys showed on your presentations um, to engage with, with the people at, you know, local, not only at the consumer level, but, you know, local people who can help us advocate for the conservation of this amazing ecosystem? Well, that's a great question, you know, and as, as some of the, uh, our audience here, you know, may know if you've been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, we actually have a wonderful Laison albatross, um, Makana, uh, at the aquarium, who was a research bird um, and, a, and a program um, that was happening in Hawaii that um, she was injured. Um, she was hatched and, and injured her wing, and so she couldn't be put back in the wild. She's been with us um, as 
as an ambassador bird at the aquarium and has uh, delighted literally millions and millions. I mean, we have 2 million people come to the aquarium every year. And I have to say, it's just, people have no idea about these birds. And even if they see a picture, they think it's a gull or something. And, and, and in fact, when they see Makata, you know, they think, oh, is she just a big seagull? And, you know, but when you talk about the bird, I mean, we have, I really encourage anyone who can make it to California to come see us because we have a, a, a wonderful interpretive program about her and we show, you know, an example of plastic, you know, from the gut of one animal is very, and then we've got a nice video that talks about the exact issues and what we need to do, which in the case of our audience is get people to, uh, you know, buy sustainable, to press for sustainable seafood. Um, you know, I think that, I think the films and, and videos and just getting the stories out there, they're so beautiful, they're so compelling. Um, they live in places people will never see, you know, and the, those few of us that are privileged to have visited places like South Georgia, it, it's just mind blowing. And um, so, you know, I think the best we can do is, is really encourage and support, uh, you know, those virtual experiences to tell the stories and bring people up close, um, you know, rare, rare occasions. Uh, there you go. There we have, uh, uh, there we have Makata. She is just, she's such an amazing, amazing cosmic bird, you know? And for example, the news we just heard about wisdom laying a second age, a second egg, you know, organizations like us, we push out because we have a huge social media following, you know, we push out information like that. It's just a remarkable story. It's inspiring. It's incredible. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, and so that's, that's, that's what we need to do really. Yeah. Gary was saying that Makana beat her, beat him um, <laughs> when he went to the Monterey Aquarium. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, birds as, um, as an ambassador of marine life, Carolina. And we have a couple of really cool examples of how birds are actually telling us when people are not behaving well. Take it on. Um, okay, so <laughs> we, we, with the tracking data, we can, we can uh, learn where birds are going and uh, the places that they were going, the, the time that they're spending out there. And then we can cross reference this information with information on where the fishing vessels are. And therefore we can predict the risk of these birds being by caught, uh, as Steph was saying, by, by the, uh, the, the fishing vessels. So, so the, this is quite, a, again, a good example where our information has been supporting, you know, this, this conservation work and informing us. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, Steph has showed one of these graphs with the blue blobs where we overlap the data of the seabirds, where they are and where the fishing vessels are. And that we can, with that information, we can say these areas should be eventually avoided or these fishing uh, mitigation measures should be adopted more strictly. Or, you know, we can set some of the measures that can guide us in some of the measures that uh, we provide the conservation of birds. Yeah, um, so very quickly, because there's a question from Chris about what do we use to monitor them? There, it's not rings. Um, it's a lot more sophisticated than that right now. Carolina, can you take on that? Sorry, I will go to Steph in a minute. What are we, could you... what are, what are we using to track the birds? Not rings, are we? Ring, only rings? No. It's, um, we use uh, uh, devices, these tiny devices, and uh, I'm not the very expert in saying the... Do you want me to answer? Yes, please. I think Steph is better positioned to run for that. Sure, sure. Unfortunately, I don't get to do it myself, um, but we are putting out tracking devices on the birds. So it really depends on the species as to what size a device you can have on it, because it needs to be small enough to not cause any impacts to that bird. So some of the devices that we use are satellite trackers, so we can see on a map where those birds are all the time. Um, and then others, they're called GPS devices and GLS devices. And so those you have to actually 
recatch the bird back at the colony when it returns after either just a foraging trip or sometimes they can stay on for a whole year waiting for them to come back. And then you can download the data and see where they're going. But that technology has come on massively in the last 20 years. So now we can we can tag the smallest of birds pretty much. So it's really fascinating when you do that on a new species and find out that they're traveling to these places you hadn't even imagined. Um, I want to go into something that is incredibly, um, I mean, it's, it's a new threat. Uh, and I don't know how much or if we are doing anything with bird life, at, bird life at, uh, at all right now, but seabed mining. Um, so I'm not sure if that is Carolina or Stephanie, or maybe, <laughs> I don't, I, are we doing anything? I, I know that it's, it's, it's booming um, and it's happening. And I saw an, a spectacular article of the Natural History Museum uh, in London about how much we are learning um, out of just uh, the the exploration that they are doing on the high on, on the high seas and the seabeds for mining of amazing biodiversity that we didn't have anything recorded and how quickly that can go because of seabed mining. Carolina, yes, I, I'm happy. To to, to answer that, Patricia, it, it is a very important question. So seabed mining is an emerging threat to the marine environment, a very significant one. Um, currently, there's no seabed mining in the high seas taking place, but there are various concessions already given to countries to explore. So they are in, in the phase of exploration and they will soon eventually uh, start exploiting, uh, really collecting these, these, these minerals, these nodules in, in the high seas. Um, there's lots of discussions on, on, on that regard, including there are calls for, for, not for bunny, but for a moratorium of uh, seabed mining, while there is no uh, scientific evidence to understand exactly the impact. I mean, I've read many papers which show the massive impact that in, it, it can cause in, in the, in the seafloor, but also in the water column because of the sediments and some of the chemicals that are used uh, during the process of extracting these mines. In terms of bird life work, we are following the discussions. Uh, Patricia, we are not doing uh, any work ourselves in the high seas, but um, what we are looking at is including uh, watching very, very closely the evidence that tells the story of how seabed mining can impact uh, the, the seabirds that use the, the, the are above the water. But of course, that, that there will be such an impact in the water column that there will be, we understand that there will be a consequence to the seabird populations as well. Um, Julie, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, this is, you know, it's something that, that we, it, it, in the ocean conservation community have heard about for decades and it's finally you know ramping up and as carolina says it's not going on in the high seas yet but they are ramping up to letting the concessions and the problem is that i mean obviously it's not a good thing it it has we know it will have a lot of negative impacts and we also don't understand the impacts very well, and it's and the seafloor um, in the depths takes a very long time to recover. I mean, you can look at trawl tracks there that have been there for decades. Um, it's not unlike the desert. Um, so disturbance lasts for a very long time, and then um, there are other very uh, very interesting, you know, impacts that we haven't even that we don't really even understand. One of which I think a paper is coming out about soon is the role of um, those deep sea sediments in sequestering carbon in terms of, of you know, the ocean takes up so much of the CO2, um, excess CO2 in the atmosphere and uh, you know, a disturbance can have a big impact. I wanted to just touch briefly on, you know, so what can we all, you know, be, advocating for, and there are going to be NGOs right now, NGOs are starting to advocate for, you know, let's take more time. Let's call out a 10 year moratorium. We need more science, we need more study. But also in the big picture, you know, we use those, um, those rare earth minerals, you know, every day, we, you know, every one of us on this call is using them right now. They're in our computers, they're in our phones. And so to press for alternatives, um, to them and 
uh, I mean, more recycling of, of, those, of those compounds and minerals, but also um, other technological solutions. And again, I can see it evolving, you know, as, as companies start to work on those matters, you know, we can, we can support the ones that are talking about this issue, you know, when we, when we buy our purchases, but we, we need some solutions uh, to, you know, beyond just going for it and, and trying to, to, to minimize risk. And then finally, I'd say the governance of this, I mean, Carolina gave a great explanation of ocean governance, which already is a crazy complicated thing. The deep sea mining is governed by this group that no one has any transparency into or ability to influence. So um, many problems there. So I think it's absolutely urgent that we join forces and, and uh, advocate for the moratorium. I absolutely agree with you. It's, um, it, it's, it's scary. <laughs> it's scary. Um, all right, let's go. Let's go on to. We have ten more minutes, uh, so I want to go back to a little bit of um, consumers, but also about areas. Uh, let me start with areas first, and then we'll finish with consumers. Um, Carolina or Steph, I don't know who of you can respond to this, but uh, CV from uh, Portugal is saying, I would like to know if the Azores are an important high seas. Uh, bird area, um, and if so, if you if you are working there in with conservation programs, I know that we work with SPEA a lot in the Azores, but mainly on invasive species. I don't know how much are we actually doing in terms of seabird concept. Well, the the shearwaters, yeah, um, and the patrols, I guess. Um, Carolina. Um, I I. Maybe to clarify one thing, which uh, Azores is, is an island very offshore, but every piece of land that belongs to a country, the 200 miles from the coast is considered the exclusive economic zone. So although it's offshore, the Azores is not in the high seas. I mean, the, the, the surrounding of the Azores is not considered the high seas. Um, so every piece of land we start counting from, from there, the 200 miles, and just beyond that, we consider the high seas. Um, so I, I wanted to clarify that, but um, I, I think uh, I would uh, defer to spare group to, to respond on, on areas that are being worked, at areas of work in, in our stories. Well, Richard can but jump. Definitely, it's an important area for civil rights, yeah. Yeah, Great. thanks, Patricia. Yeah, just to add to what Carolina has said, the, the Azores are a very important area for breeding seabirds, um, particularly for breeding um, quarry shearwater. So huge colonies there, I think um, um, probably the most important in, in Europe, um, along with other uh, seabird species like uh, Bulwars petrel um, and uh, other smaller seabirds. So very important breeding area and those birds of course are dispersing into into the uh, Atlantic Ocean so many of those species will be using the high seas. Uh, Carolina showed a very nice um, demonstration of that. I think that was actually for Cory Shearwater that demonstration you showed um, that looked at the distribution of, of uh, what I think was Cory's in the on their breeding grounds and offshore waters and then on the high seas. So Cory shearwaters will be dispersing into the, into the uh, Atlantic and spending the winter months in the South Atlantic. And um, that means a lot of time on the high seas and, and time interacting with these, these fishing fleets. And so they are a species that can be, can be impacted by, by bycatch. So a very important region of the world. Thank you, Richard. Um, Steph, do you want it to jump in as well? Or are we good? Should we move? We can move. I think Richard, Richard gave a really good answer there. All right. So I wanted to go back to consumers. And, and Julie, we had spoken a lot about the role that consumers and, and the general public have. But there's a question from George uh, in Washington um, about uh, whether there, as a regular consumer, we can identify tuna or other fisheries by species, country of origin, or certification label that are al albatross friendly. 
Yes, well, um, it's interesting. Seafood Watch is just about to uh, release updated assessments for all the tuna fisheries. And believe me, it's very complicated, as you can imagine, looking at the ocean, because, you know, it, it's not just done by species. It's by the fishery, you know, a species in the South Atlantic or a different species. Basically, overall, the news is, is not good. I mean, just in, in the past decade, the you know, well, first of all, as many people know, um, tuna populations took a huge dive in the Atlantic way back in the 80s, and especially the bluefin tuna, which is such an iconic, amazing, magnificent animal, and um, was, was hugely overfished. And because these regional fisheries management bodies are so, in a, you know, ineffective, they just you know, kept overfishing until the bluefin, you know, was essentially on the verge of commercial extinction, it's finally starting to recover. Meantime, the fishing pressure in the Pacific has just gone crazy. And so unfortunately, this new tuna assessment, I haven't even looked at it, but it's not good. So what should you do? Um, this is is what I was referring to with what's getting so confusing for consumers is that the more we overfish areas, you know, finding out which thing to buy is, is you know, it is increasingly difficult. So as far as tuna goes, you should go on our website, seafoodwatch.org. It was recently updated. There's so much great information there and you can just put in, um, you know, put in whatever uh, species you're looking for, if you're looking for tuna, and generally speaking, something that's caught with, you know, uh, hook and line or troll caught, obviously, you know, it, a lot of tuna is caught with long lines. That's not good. Um, you could go in there and probably find out maybe there are some that we might give uh, still a yellow rating to. A lot of them have moved from the yellow to the red. Most of them have been in the yellow rating for quite a long time due to overfishing. I mean, the number one criterion for Seafood Watch sustainability is, is it overfished? And the tuna fisheries pretty much everywhere are under, under huge pressure right now. So go on the site, uh, pick something that is, uh, you know, caught with a less industrial method, if you can find it. And um, you, you'll see all the data, all the data there and really, really appreciate your interest in that because who doesn't love tuna? You know, that's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Great, thank you. Um, all right, there's one last question that I wanna put on the table and I, Richard, I'm gonna invite you to join in and, um, and I haven't introduced you properly. For those of you who don't know Richard, Richard is the Global Director of Conservation. The Marine Program is under his uh, division. Um, so the question says, bless you, Julie. <laughs> Bird life looks like it has made amazing progress engaging with fishers uh, and governments about the conservation of seabirds. Much work still needs to be done for other marine taxa. What advice would you give to other people looking to further conservation initiatives for the suit of marine megafauna beyond just seabirds? And what lessons can we learn from bird life? So why don't you give it a try and then we'll go that's to- a, that's, a, that's a challenging question. I think the, f the first thing to say is that it's not just birds that are impacted by bycatch. It's a, it's a serious issue for, for turtles, uh, obviously uh, for, you know, for cetaceans, um, dolphins and porpoises. Um, so, you know, other, other groups have made some progress in this area, uh, including, you know, mitigation measures that can, can be effective. Um, some really great work being done to uh, reduce bycatch with, with, with turtles, for example. So understanding the problem, uh, researching and testing solutions. Uh, we've done that with, with mitigation measures for seabirds. That's, that's clearly critically important for, for, for other groups. I think where we've, where we've also shown um, we can make good progress is, is making sure we're clear about the science so that's clear about the, you know, the, the, the threats, the, the distribution, um, the use of, 
of C areas by uh, other other taxa, making sure you your your you know understanding of the issues, your understanding of the geographic priorities is you know is absolutely clear. Um, we've done some great work, as I hope we've shown you in identifying where are the most important areas for seabirds. They often overlap with areas important for other taxa, uh, particularly cetaceans. So having clarity about those uh, important geographies is, is also an important step. And then, and then working with others. Um, so we've worked with other expert groups, um, making sure there's a consensus regarding where these priority areas are, and then working together to you know, advance uh, solutions, including you know, in, in relation to you know, marine protected areas and marine spatial area management. But that science is important. Um, the, the the engagement, you know, with governments, uh, it's it's it can be challenging. Um, and and we've heard you know about our work with the regional fisheries management organisations, but also with with national governments. You know, trying to take a an approach that is 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 you know is looking for those win win solutions where where you know industry and communities. Uh, can can gain from conservation measures, um, but, you know, where there are benefits for both for both biodiversity and and people. Um, working with stakeholders to uh, achieve those outcomes, that's more likely to get progress than um, uh, a more confrontational approach. But there's a there's a there's a long way to go, and uh, you've seen that you know the journey we've been on with you know with seabirds. It's there's no quick fixes. It takes time, and so I suppose the last point is, is stick with that agenda. Keep 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 working on it. Don't don't give up on this. Uh, you know, really important. Um, you know, wonder of of of, of um, planet Earth. Let's let's do what we can to uh, to protect nature on the high seas and uh, on the uh, on the oceans. Um, not sure if that helped, but um, hopefully some pointers there. Thank you, Richard. Um... No, and there was a really good comment about how sharks and juvenile sharks are being caught um, in and and are part of the bycatch. So um, uh, no, that was great. We are at time, um, and I think I just lost Sarah when I was supposed to put the screen. So you all can join us. I think Richard made a very good uh, point about the role of sticking to these agenda in the long run. And I do want to give a special shout out to the Packard Foundation. Uh, Julie, not because you're here, but because we have had incredible support from the Packard Foundation along the years um, and uh, all the donors who have supported the marine program and the Albatross Task Force. Uh, we have been able to do this only because you believe in us and because you have been um, willing to take on this risk for a long period of time, um, and we really appreciate it. Um, uh, okay, Sarah seems to be back, so hopefully we can put that, that slide on. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's lovely to have so many of you still now. Thanks for your donations already, um, but we cannot do this work without your support. So if you have a chance, please visit our donor box uh, to support the great work that the Marine team is doing not only with our fantastic bycatch successes and making sure that we are expanding them to other fisheries, but also with the policy and the governance of the seas. You saw from Carolina's presentation the importance of making sure that we have proper governance for the high seas. Um, and with Julie's extraordinary comments, how important it is to connect to the consumers. So thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned. Uh, we have more of the conservation webinar series coming up, sharing with you all of the great work that BirdLife and BirdLife partners are doing around the world, um, using birds as the best ambassador for nature. Um, and yeah, um, we will we will keep your uh, questions and sorry for so many of you that we were not able to get to, but great questions, great participation and fantastic panelists. Great to have all women, except for Richard. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us um, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>